to Shakiria Redman. She is a fifth grade student at Timberlawn Elementary School, where Dr. Lynn Horton serves as the principal. Ladeja is friendly, thoughtful, enthusiastic, and is a lover of life. Ladeja is active in religious affairs and attends Brian Seventh Day Adventist Church in Jackson, Mississippi. Her hobbies include reading, dancing, and singing. Ladeja has been involved in the following activities. First place, 2019 JPS Reading Fair winner, City Dance Performing Arts Ballet member, Heavenly Praise Dance team member, Brennan Church Sign Language member, Brennan Church Youth Choir member. Adeja plans, her college plans are to attend Cornell University and become a veterinarian. Let's welcome Adeja. Good evening, my name is Ladeja Blevins. I'm a fifth grade student at Timberland Elementary. May you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. Thank you, Ladeja, for leading the pledge for us this evening. Do you have any family with you? Uh, any family members? Would you please stand? Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming out and supporting. Next, we have our um, words of encouragement by Mrs. Ada Gator. Mrs. Gator is a 25-year-plus veteran educator of JPS schools. She has worked in various capacities, including behavior disorder teacher at Lee Elementary, PAC and ISS teacher at Marshall Elementary, and currently behavior support in ISS at Oak Forest Elementary. She has also served as lower elementary alternative placement teacher member for 13 elementary schools in South Jackson. Mrs. Gator is an elated graduate of the I Love Jackson State University. She is married to Michael Gator and they are the proud parents of five daughters who are all JPS graduates and two grandchildren who currently attend JPS. Her mantra is today is a great day to have a great day. Thank you. Indeed, today is a great day to have a great day. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. But I hope that someday you'll join us so the world can live as one. Good evening, indeed I am Ada Gator and it is my pleasure to bring you words of encouragement. Dr. Green, Chief Encourager Extraordinaire, thank you for this invitation and to the board and its members and all attending. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Well, the aforementioned lyrics are from John Lennon's 1971 smash single hit, Imagine, you have it. And John Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, were inspired by civil rights activist and comedian Dick Gregory. He himself was still reeling from the injustices of the turbulent 50s and 60s and imagined a world of love, peace, and racial harmony. But the world would need a lot of encouragement. Indeed, we all need encouragement. From the moment our feet hit the floor and we start bouncing around to live our best lives. And we put on that fresh morning glow straight through to the afternoon when that fresh morning glow starts to go. <laughs> and for sure, right about now, at the end of the day, when so much has come through your way, it's real hard and you need a lot of encouragement. So I can only imagine that you can imagine that you would love to have a big, fat, juicy char burger, fully dressed, hot french fries, and perhaps a glass of Merlot, if you partake of spirits. 
Or maybe you might like something a little simpler, like Amerigo's shrimp pasta salad, dim lights, soft music. Or you're probably thinking, now hurry up, ma'am, I'm ready to go, because I could use leftovers from yesterday, <laughs> a Lakers game, or maybe, are you smarter than a fifth grader on demand? Whatever your pleasure, you're here working together to transform lives through excellent education. And for that, we owe you a great debt of gratitude. Thank you all for sharing today. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can only imagine your days are long and your nights are fraught with worries and concerns about budgets, buildings, break-ins, fights, teacher shortages, hirings, firings, and the like. I can imagine some days you find yourselves in a few dark places and you feel buried. But imagine, you're not buried, you're planted. And you are planted exactly, precisely where you are intended. So grow and grow great, because everything you need to accomplish your goal is already in you. I said it's already in you. You were hand-selected and perfectly planted where you are needed. I say to you, the world is full of dreamers, and we may not ever know everyone, but you will know them by the work they've done. Dr. King had a dream, but he was not the only one. He encouraged all races, creeds, and colors to join him so the world could live as one. I can only imagine his vision of little black boys and little black girls joining hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers as they marched toward Lookout Mountain. And when they got to the top of Lookout Mountain, I can only imagine as they peered through the clouds that there they met equity. And equity stared them right back in the eye, eye to eye. And it was an inheritance that always meant simply put, all means all, not for some, but for everyone. And their shoulder to shoulder excellence, it was a high expectation instilled and drilled in one from the cradle to the grave with attention to detail and quality in order to achieve greatness. Well, right beside it was growth mindset. Set in stone, pressed down, uh, passed down from generation to generation, placed at one's feet, picked up, pressed down, shaken together and running over, affirming the ideal that effort plus perseverance equals success making room for great relationships that are cultivated, caressed, nurtured, and developed through mutual respect of culture, social context, and community. Just imagine relevance was a retroactive experience that was engaging, motivating, and inspiring connections with others causing worldwide change. And everybody and every experience was relevant and celebrated. Ideals and individualism were expected, accepted, respected, and then protected. Mm -hmm. Forging a positive and respectful culture as natural as the day is long. Because climates were safe, positive, and respectful. Now that's a win-win for all. Can you just imagine that vision? Well, Dr. Green, chief encourager extraordinaire, has a dream, but he's not the only one. Yeah. But he does need all of us, each and every one of us, to join him and celebrate equity, equi excellence, mind growth, set, growth mindset, relationships, relevance, and positive and respectful culture so Jackson Public Schools can prosper and grow as one. Remember, together we can do so much, alone we can do so little. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gator. That was absolutely wonderful. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> 
figures, do they? <laughs> Ms. Kay, do you have any family here with you? No, not today, but I do have my friend Corbin. Let's take your lucky And I didn't tell them about it. I really didn't even want to give uh, a bio because they always sound like uh, a rap sheet. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I love you, Ms. Gator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, board members, we have a quorum. Everyone is present. Um, and we are now on the adoption of the agenda. We have all had an opportunity to, to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? I move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Doc OK. Go ahead, Mr. Figures. Um, Dr. Harrison has moved, and Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Next on the agenda, we have the approving of the minutes. Board members, we've had an opportunity to review the minutes in advance. Is there a motion to approve the minutes for February 18, 2020? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Um, Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays? There being none, the motion is approved. And now... Um, the superintendent's report. Thank you, Attorney Johnson. Uh, greetings board members to our JPS staff members, administrators, parents, community members, everyone who is, uh, and our scholars, of course, who are joining with us here this evening and those who are watching live screen, stream, stream on the screen. Uh, we will begin, as we typically do, with a video presentation from our talented instructional television production team. Take it away. William Garfield Walker, a graduate of Power APAC and a longtime participant in the Mississippi Symphony Orchestra's MSO Youth Symphony Program, is now an orchestral conductor. Mr. Walker has been invited by MSO to conduct a Schubert Symphony on their Spring Delight Chamber concert at Millsaps College on March 7th. Walker will conduct Schubert's famous Unfinished Symphony, which was performed first during MSO's concert in 1944. Mr. Walker will also conduct one of the student ensembles for the MSO JPS All City Strings performance at Thalyamara Hall, Walker is a graduate of the Royal College of Music in London, the Music and Arts University of the City of Vienna, and was the first conductor to graduate from the top graduate diploma program. For more information about William Walker, please visit the website seen here. JROTC Cadet Sam Unique Blackman is the 2020 JPS Cadet of the Year. She was promoted to the rank of Cadet Colonel and will serve as the JPS JROTC Brigade Commander for 2020-2021. Sam Unique is a junior at Callaway High School and serves as the 4th Battalion Executive Officer. She has a GPA of 3.8 and an ACT score of 20. One of her goals is to raise her GPA and to graduate valedictorian of her class. After high school, Blackman plans to attend medical school and to specialize in neurosurgery. Congratulations, Amory Thomas. The Barack Obama Magnet School fifth grader was named runner-up in the 2020 Hines County Spelling Bee. Amory, a student at Obama Obama Magnet since kindergarten is an active member of the school community. She participates in the STEM Club, Pep Squad, Junior Beta Honor Society, and serves as a school ambassador. Also an avid reader and enjoys learning Spanish. Amory is the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Alex and Amanda Thomas. Amanda Thomas is the district's executive director of climate and wellness. The North teams defeated the South team during the second annual JPS All star soccer game by a score of 7-3. to three. The North team is represented by players from Callaway, Murrah, and Provine. And the South team is represented by players from Forest Hill, Jim Hill, and Wingfield High Schools. The head coach for the North team was Ronaldo Millsap. And the head coach for the South team is Frederick Davis. 
Congratulations to Northwest Lady Wolverines and to the Hardy Panthers on winning the 2019-2020 JPS Middle School Basketball Championships. Head coach for the Lady Wolverines is Ashley Sutton. The Hardy Panthers coach is Manu Adisa. Joyce Greer is the 2019-2020 Counselor of the Year for Jackson Public Schools. Greer, an educator at Bates Elementary School, is the veteran educator with more than 20 years of experience. Greer was recently elected Secretary of the Mississippi School Counselor Association and is an active member of several professional counseling organizations. Awards were presented as part of National Counseling Week Appreciation. Congratulations once again to Joyce Greer. With the help of Atmos Energy and Brent Bailey of Mississippi's Public Service Commission, JPS is making strides in becoming more energy efficient. Atmos Energy and Commissioner Brent Bailey, through a partnership with Atmos Energy's Smart Choice Program, donated a check for $5,350 to the district to achieve that effort. The funds will be used for the installation of condensing water heaters and energy efficient natural combination ovens into four elementary cafeterias. The funds will go to Smith Elementary, Galloway Elementary, Green Elementary, and McWillie. Jackson Public Schools is hosting a spring job fair on Saturday, March 21st at Cardozo Middle School. The fair is open from 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. PM. Attendees can apply for both teaching and non-teaching positions. To see vacancies or to apply for a JPS position, visit www www.jackson.k12.ms.us forward slash apply. For more information, please call 601-985-3159. And for the latest information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and our YouTube channel. As always, want to thank our uh, talented team for producing those highlights um, from across the district. As you can see, uh, we have a lot to, to brag about. Lots of things happening with our young people, our teams um, within the community, and so we're just so excited to always bring such wonderful news about what the, these amazing folks are doing throughout JPS land. Um, I do want to uh, pause here and acknowledge um, an event that occurred uh, recently. As many of you know, JPS recently fell victim to a cyber crime. Um, while no data was extracted, again I say no data was extracted um, uh, from the district, the criminals did interrupt our work uh, at, our, at school sites and um, at central office. Um, in our central offices. So we're working still with uh, officials to fully investigate this crime, um, to obviously to bring those criminals to justice and to ensure that we're uh, constantly learning from these, this unfortunate experience. Um, it is unfortunate that um, uh, a good handful of districts around the state and probably many, many others around the, the country uh, have fallen victim to such crimes. Uh, in, in fact, even the city, the city of Jackson recently fell victim to um, a, cyber, a cyber crime of some sort. And so we are, um, we're working with others, with our peers in other districts. We're working with the city, as I said, with the uh, city of, or, or with um, the officials to fully understand exactly what uh, occurred, who did, uh, try to determine who did this um, um, criminal act and, and just to uh, ensure that we're uh, always continuing to learn from those experiences. Um, I want to clarify that uh, we, once we were uh, made aware, and that was pretty quick, we, once we were made aware of the, uh, of the interruption that we took our own system down uh, in the abundance of, of caution. We took our system offline, um, uh, regrouped, we uh, asked and directed all of our teams not to use devices uh, until our, our IT officials could go through and wipe them clean and ensure that there weren't any dormant uh, threats there. I'm sharing this because there, are, um, the, you know, the retelling of these kinds of events, oftentimes folks start to create some truths that, that aren't exactly 
um, uh, rooted in the reality of, of what occurred. We took uh, the precautions, we took our system down, our system went back up within the next couple of days. Uh, we've continued to wipe devices clean across the district. Uh, as you might imagine, with 23,000 students and with 4,000 or so employees, we've got quite a number of devices throughout the system, and so that just, it's taken time. Unfortunately, that has meant some uh, delays and some um, interruptions to the way that we typically instruct and the way that we typically do our business and business offices and all of that. Several people throughout the, the district have experienced that, uh, but our, team, our teams are moving very quickly to get us completely back up and moving and stronger than ever. Um, we've engaged with, as I said, with officials, with our attorneys, with, um, with uh, even insurance companies, just on and on to ensure that uh, no stone, stone is left unturned and we feel uh, very good about um, really the, uh, thankfully, the, um, the limited impact uh, that this event, that this crime has had on us and the lessons that we've learned from others to ensure that we're even more protected going forward. So I did want to just share that, acknowledge that, um, and let the entire community know that um, we're not just kind of sitting back and, and waiting, uh, but that we're taking decisive action with the, um, with the smart people to help us to, to get even smarter. Um, speaking of threats, I'd like to take a moment now to address uh, questions and concerns regarding the coronavirus. Um, first, I wanna name that there have been no reported cases of uh, coronavirus um, in the state of Mississippi. We certainly don't have any here um, uh, reported here in Jackson Public Schools. However, uh, JPS, our officials, our team is monitoring uh, updates um, from health officials and we're following the recommendations of local officials, uh, local health officials, just to help to keep our, our scholars and our teams and the entire JPS community, all stakeholders, uh, safe and healthy. There is no plan at this point to disrupt or change our regularly scheduled uh, instruction uh, and, and our school day or, or any of that at this time. Um, we will, as I said, continue to monitor and, and determine if any changes need to be made, but there's not a plan to disrupt our regularly uh, scheduled um, schools. Facilities team, uh, facilities and operations team will continue to uh, do their cleanings of, uh, of our schools uh, as they have been um, in our schools and our district buildings as well. We want to remind um, and this is always the case, but we really want to remind all of our stakeholders to practice uh, some uh, safety tips, uh, typical uh, kinds of practices that we would expect folks to do, but for sure, even when, they're, um, when we're in the flu season, which we are as well. Uh, and those include, um, those measures include washing your hands frequently with soap and water, Often, um, we're often uh, encouraged to wash them for about 20 seconds or so. Uh, some folks will sing a song or, or tell a joke or something uh, for about 20 seconds. Um, and also utilizing, if you don't have easy access to water and soap, utilizing alcohol-based hand sanitizer, um, uh, just to, again, to ward off those viruses. Um, we are often asked, how can we help uh, by by uh, faith-based organizations, community organizations, parents, others. Um, this would be a great time for folks to, if you are able to help to supply us with um, sanitary wipes and that sort of thing, those um, Clorox wipes and that sort of thing, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, any of a tissue, any of that would be um, uh, greatly appreciated at our schools and, and uh, throughout the district as well. Uh, if folks are able and want to work along with our school uh, leadership to um, uh, establish a cleanup day, wiping the surfaces 
of desks, of knobs, and that sort of thing, that you can never be too careful about that sort of thing. And, and watching the news in the last few days, there's been a huge focus on that sort of thing, even in your homes, let alone in a space where we're together. And so those are just some of the things that occur to us and uh, to the extent that individuals are able to help and, and support us and want to do something, those are the kinds of things that certainly cannot, cannot hurt. Um, for more information, please do contact the Mississippi Department of Health um, or visit the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Their website is www.cdccharliedavidcharliecdc at gov. It's www.cdc.gov. And now I have a really big announcement to make. <laughs> That big announcement is that spring break happens next week. <laughs> spring break will, will be March the 9th through the 13th. Yes, folks, JPS, schools and offices will be closed next week. And so if you weren't aware, now you are. <laughs> I encourage all of our scholars and staff, please, please, please take time to take care of yourselves. We want you to be safe. We want you to, we want you to enjoy your time away. Um, get some rest. All of us need a little bit of rest. And by all means, young people, actually for all of us, read a book. Mm -hmm. Read something. And be ready uh, when you come back to school to finish strong. We've had a wonderful start to this school year. Here's a time for us to break, regroup, and come back to have a wonderful end to the school year. And we come back on Monday, uh, March the 16th. I almost said May. That's not true. March the 16th. Come back March the 16th. Once again, our young people are making national waves. Over 10,000 students participated in the 2019 Congressional App Challenge. For the third consecutive year, board members, our amazing JPS Career Development Center scholars have won the challenge. Three years. The simulation and animation instructor, Ms. Uh, Maisha Wallace, will now join us to introduce the app winners. Ms. Wallace, please join us. And I have to build you a showcase for all your, all your accolades. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, as the universe will have it, a memory popped on my Facebook timeline from when we won our first <laughs> app challenge. And so tonight I reflect on Ms. Gator's words and realize it's a blessing to walk in your calling. And that being said, I would like to introduce this year's Congressional App Challenge winners, Shamaya Robinson. Cameron Lewis and Shamar Stamps isn't with us tonight, but he's one of our winners too. They're going to tell you about their app. So um, the name of my app is Canada's Crew, and it's an app made to um, cope with mental illness. Okay. Okay, so Canadis is a Latin word for sound, and the app uses sound therapy to cure those with anxiety and depression, and the app also lets you use forms to connect with others that might also suffer with your same condition, and you can also talk to counselors that can also help. How, how can we access the app? Can we, can we find it? Is it available? Uh, it's not available yet, but we're working for it. Okay. All right. All right. You're building up desire and, and an interest in it. So get it out there. Thank you so much. We're working to put it on the platform. They do have it finished. They just haven't put it on the platform yet. Understood. Yay. Wow. Let's give Ms. Wallace and our talented scholars another round of applause.
And now, board members, we have an important call to action. The 2020 census counts every person living in the 50 states, the District of Columbia, and our five U.S. territories. The count is mandated by the Constitution and conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, a nonpartisan government agency. Each home receives the questionnaire um, online, by phone, or uh, by mail. Our Chief of Staff, Dr. Michael Cormack, will now come um, and share a bit more about the JPS, about how the JPS community can support the effort to maximize participation and why it is so important. Dr. Cormack. Good evening, uh, Good evening. Board President Johnson, Dr. Green, members of the board. Uh, I have the pleasure this evening of presenting JPS Counts um, about our efforts to support the 2020 U.S. Census. So this evening, our objectives are as follows, uh, to encourage participation of JPS stakeholders in the 2020 U.S. Census, to explain the importance of census participation and receiving an accurate count for our district, and uh, to share some of our district's efforts to collaborate with the U.S. Census and some of our other community partners. So I begin by addressing the question of what is the census? So as Dr. Green mentioned, the U.S. Census is a constitutionally mandated uh, decennial count every 10 years of all persons living in the United States. That includes uh, all persons, so that's citizens, non-citizens, um, all people living in the country. Um, and it is uh, incredibly important because it's used to determine congressional apportionment for our U.S. House of Representatives. So um, our, each of our congressional districts in each of our states, that congressional apportionment is based on this official count of the number of persons living in our country. And it also serves as an official count for federal disbursement of funds. About $675 billion is dispersed from federal funds um, that uh, it's really important uh, on the basis of that count. This year, the census can be completed by paper, online, and by phone. And this is actually the first time uh, that the census will be completed in an online uh, mechanism. Um, they did so in, in order to encourage uh, increased participation. Um, and specifically, historically, communities of color and low-income communities have often been undercounted in the U.S. Census. And so uh, given the importance of this effort, um, JPS is partnering with a number of community partners in order to increase our turnout and to ensure that JPS counts. So some of the partners included in uh, this partnership include uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and One Voice, who's done a number of uh, stakeholder convenings throughout the community. Um, of course, the city of Jackson, which is an important part of this effort. Um, and this task force gets together on a monthly basis to discuss strategies and ways to integrate uh, census activities and encourage participation uh, on a monthly uh, basis. Uh, Mrs. Thea Faulkner, who is our director of uh, partners in education, um, is our regular attendee of these sessions. Um, in the next slide, I want to share with you just a brief video about a one-minute presentation that the Kellogg Foundation and our partners um, have collaborated on to encourage participation. Um, it's available in uh, a, a variety of different languages, but we wanted to share it with you because it captures uh, why this effort is so important. Everyone counts in Mississippi, yet many people are left out of the federal census. The hardest to count include children ages 0 to 5, immigrants and non-English speakers, people of color, Native Americans, those living in poverty, renters, and people in rural locations. In Mississippi, every person counted results in approximately $2,053 in federal funding per year. That's more than $20,000 per person per decade. An accurate count is essential to a thriving economy, educational opportunities, and healthy, equitable communities. Every household can participate in the census through the web, mail, or by phone. Be on the lookout for your census.
census invitation in March and April 2020. Talk to your neighbors, friends, and family, especially those with young children, and remind them of how valuable their participation is. When everyone counts, everyone thrives. So we share that video because we think it captures in a nutshell the importance of participation in our census. Um, additionally, we are encouraging teachers um, to download and make available uh, resources. Uh, the U.S. Census has a program uh, for K-12 uh, called Statistics in Schools, where students are able to use the census data in order to inform um, them more about uh, census participation. It also has the additional benefit of uh, the children and our scholars, as they learn about that, they encourage mom and dad and, and families uh, to participate. Uh, for our beginning scholars, our elementary scholars, there are a number of lessons uh, on map and geography skills. Um, and uh, the math lessons incorporate uh, figures on the population uh, for the state and state comparisons. And so they learn uh, graphing and tables, things that are connected with the skills that they're building in the classroom. For our middle school scholars, there are additionally lessons on cultural diversity uh, because one of the components of the census is to look at uh, racial and ethnic uh, demographic information. So students are able to explore historical trends in uh, ethnic populations and the shift in our U.S. population over time, um, over, the, over the decades. And for our high school scholars, there are even lessons in sociology, uh, which encourage students to look at uh, changes in family patterns. And so one of the, uh, the pieces of information about the census is uh, the family structure and family dynamics. And so our high school scholars are encouraged to look at uh, evolving uh, family dynamics over the decades. And so there's some really meaningful uh, pedagogical implications to the census and ways for the students uh, to engage with this effort as well. So our upcoming efforts include these uh, continued community task force meetings. We are encouraging, they have encouraged the district and community partners to incorporate U.S. Census activities into regularly scheduled events. Um, our programming at the Morrison Complex, which is where our partners in education and family partnerships are located, uh, will offer census uh, online stations. They have a number of uh, computers that are accessible for our parents and families that may be technologically challenged. The census has not yet launched, uh, but will launch in mid-May with, with flyers uh, and then follow up through early April. Uh, and then the, um, the census takers that do the door-by-door -door count will continue uh, to do so. But again, as I mentioned, it is being made available in three formats, uh, by mail, uh, in, in the paper form, uh, over the phone and through the online uh, census system. So finally, for more information, we are encouraging our stakeholders uh, to visit the U.S. Census website. You can do so, uh, and it has a simple URL, which is 2020census.gov. And with that. Hey, Dr. Cormack, just for clarity, it's, it, the um, census actually launches mid-March? It does, and okay. so, um, it, yes, we were uh, presenting this information. It will launch in mid-March, but we wanted to tee that up, uh, knowing that with the break happening, mm -hmm. people may be receiving mailers. Yeah, so it's coming up pretty quickly, so folks should be watching out for, for yes, those sir. mails. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Appreciate that information. Really important that, um, that we all do our part, not only to complete the census individually or for our households, but as well that we uh, encourage others in the community. Um, it's going to matter so much for our funding and for other reasons. We now tur turn our attention to recruitment and staffing. Each school year, we're faced with a number of teacher vacancies. Um, our human resources team and teacher recruiter, uh, Dr. Knowles, uh, have been working very strategically to reduce those vacancies um, and to fill them with uh, highly effective um, and credentialed individuals. Our director of recruitment, Dr. Tommy Knowles, will join us now to share more information on teacher staffing. Dr. Knowles. All right. Good evening, Board President Johnson, Dr. Green, members of the board. Uh, tonight I wanted to take the opportunity to uh, provide as brief as possible an uh, update on our uh, staffing, uh, current staffing situation, as well as our projections and plans that we have in place for the beginning of the 2020-21 school year. 
I wanted to start by reflecting upon our vision and mission. Um, just like everyone else in the school district, uh, my job in the Office of Recruitment is also to prepare scholars to achieve globally, uh, contribute locally, and to be fulfilled individually. And also to develop scholars through world-class learning experiences by recruiting teachers who have attained an exceptional knowledge base, critical and relevant skill sets, and the necessary dispositions to be able to help our students reach that greatness. All right. So the scope of the work that we complete in the Office of Recruitment is related to uh, our strategic commitment number three, which is talented and empowered teams. And my main role is to focus specifically on helping to improve the candidate pools available to our building principals and administration as they function as hiring managers to get the best quality applicants and educators into the school building to make sure that every student has access to a highly qualified teacher. So the goals for this presentation on tonight is to provide an update on district staffing and provide information on current initiatives being utilized to address all staffing concerns. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, we'll have answers to these, uh, these essential questions. What is our current staffing situation? What are we currently doing to address pro uh, projected vacancies in hard to fill areas? And uh, what are we planning to do to continue to address vacancies in hard to fill areas? So we wanted to take a moment to dig into the data, look at the numbers, see how we've been trending over the past couple of years, and also look at the projections for this upcoming school year. So just to kind of define uh, some terminology before we get into the numbers, uh, the, the positions not filled or the vacancies that we currently have are determined by the number of signed teacher contracts not returned uh, to our office. And so there's a number of ways that those contracts would not be returned, specifically looking at expiring licenses. So as our veteran teachers who hold five-year standard licenses, their license expire, in addition to any provisionally certified teachers that we have within the district, which is composed of our special non-renewable license candidates, uh, teachers who hold veteran emergency certificates who are teaching out of field, and any teachers we have within the district who are working on an expert citizen license, those licenses have to be, uh, they're not renewable, so they have to apply for a new license every year. We also include the, the information that we get back from letters of intent, as well as uh, contracts that are non-renewed for various reasons within the district. Um, and just yesterday, the unreturned contracts were due back to the Office of Human Resources, so those numbers are living and breathing. They're fluctuating, growing, and decreasing as uh, we work through this contract season. Hmm. I think my battery might be dead. <laughs> so uh, this table is a snapshot uh, over the last three years or two years, including this school year, uh, to look at true vacancies, limited service vacancies, and positions not filled. Um, the copy that you have, I also included the number of non-renewed teaching contracts um, in that data. And so as you can see, if you look at the true vacancies, there's a big discrepancy between 2018 and March of 2019. And one of the major uh, contributors to that uh, large decrease is uh, the summer of 2018, the district hired a full-time recruiter to work on uh, focusing specifically on making sure that we address these vacancy issues. And so as you can see, just based on the trend moving toward this year, which we expect to continue, uh, the positions not filled, which are the, the, the number that I target as far as making sure that we recruit individuals to the district and get those staff with certified teachers is steadily decreasing uh, from year to year. And we, we hope to continue that. So. Um, with the approximate number of 1,450 teacher positions in the district, typically we, uh, we are currently staffed now in March at about 97%. Uh, so this, this is the, the major slide. This is what we look at as far as our projections go. So if you look at the various categories in the, in the copy that I gave you, they've been slightly redefined. 
uh, and the numbers have changed even uh, today uh, because, again, the numbers are living and breathing. As we get new information, I try to update uh, the information. So for veteran teachers, uh, what was once 176 uh, expiring licenses on yesterday, today, before I came to the meeting, has been reduced to 153. Uh, special non-renewable license teachers, their number is actually 340. Uh, veteran emergency certificates, we are at 16, and then uh, we only have one expert citizen license within the district. So with the updated numbers, that brings our total to 510 uh, projected vacancies as a result of expiring licenses. Or um, Once we received the information back from letters of intent, we had 49 teachers or individuals to indicate that they would either be resigning or not returning to the district for various reasons. So when we add all of those together, we get a projected vacancy uh, as of uh, today at 559 projected vacancies. And that's the 583 minus the 27 renewed licenses and contracts that we received on today. So as you can see, based on the numbers of last year, uh, we're slightly higher than the March 2019 vacancies. And I know those numbers can seem alarming. But as we go through each one of the categories, I can assure you that the solutions to be able to address each and every category have already been planned out, and most of them are fairly simple as it relates to how we plan to address the, uh, the contract situation and the licensure situation for candidates uh, as we prepare for August, uh, for August school start. So starting with the first category of expiring licenses for administrators and veteran teachers, uh, that number, which is now 153, are the number of teachers who, veteran teachers that we have whose licenses will expire at the end of the, the school year or on June 30th, 2020. So as part of this process, going back to August, the administrators were notified that their licenses will be expiring at the end of the year and information regarding resources on what they needed to do to complete uh, renewal requirements were issued to them. Uh, we also distributed letters to teachers at the November, for teachers at the November principals meeting to also inform them and we worked alongside the Office of Teaching and Leading to provide a menu of services for our teachers so that they can begin working and completing the requirements to earn CEUs to renew their licenses. If for any reason any teachers do not meet the requirements by the end of the school year, when their licenses expire on June 30th, there is a, uh, those veteran teachers can apply to the State Department for what's called a one-year reinstatement license. So uh, the only caveat is, is that they have to wait until the license completely expires before they're eligible to apply. So they still have from now until the remainder of the school year to meet the requirements for renewal. And if they don't meet it by June 30th, then July 1, they're able to apply for a reinstatement license, which can be auto-issued from the State Department. So we expect this number to decrease by 100% by the time school starts in August. The next group falls under the category of provisionally certified teachers. Uh, that first group would be our special non-renewable license teachers. So teachers who have provisional licenses uh, specifically non-traditional teachers, that will be the, uh, the number of 323. So when you break that number out, 308 of our special non-renewable license teachers are on year one of the special non-renewable license. That number is inflated due to the fact that this summer we also received a reprieve for our teachers who were on the special non-renewable license last year. So they're essentially considered to be uh, on, special, on year one again. So if you include last year's year ones, and the ones who we added to that number this year, we end up with that number of 308. The number of teachers who are on year two is only 12. And after looking at the numbers, we only have three that are on uh, year three for special non-renewable licenses. So we implemented a plan where we actually pre-scheduled and, and, and counseled one-on-one -on -one with each and every one of our teachers that are on a special non-renewable license. I myself, along with my team, counseled with these teachers and according to their individual need and requirements for licensure, advised them with help from the Mississippi Department of Education on what they needed to do in order to make sure that they were eligible to receive a license next year, whether that's the year two version or year three version of the special non-renewable license or 
to move forward in the licensure process to obtain either a three-year or a five-year standard license. Uh, we're also tracking this information in our, in our office. The goal is to have the tracker complete before we leave to go for spring break this Friday. So currently we're still at about 67% complete and the meetings are ongoing even as we, we speak. Um, there, is some, there are changes that we're waiting for approval from the Mississippi Department of Education, their, their board that we believe will tremendously assist us in helping us convert our year one candidates to uh, year two licenses. And with that, we will be able to retain those individuals as certified teachers within the district. The next group will be our, go back one, veteran emergency certificate teachers. So these are teachers who we requested a one year emergency certificate to teach out of field. Their license uh, itself may not be expiring, but the endorsement that we requested to allow them to teach in an uh, area that they were not originally certified to teach in, it only lasts for one year. Now these, these certificates are renewable for up to three years. The uh, only caveat is that the district must supply documentation to the State Department that the teachers are making efforts to obtain the endorsement permanently. Um, they can either attempt at passing the required certification exams to get the endorsement, or they can enroll or be in progress of completing an approved, uh, approved program for that endorsement. The last group is the expert citizen license group. This license can be renewed from year to year and for multiple years depending on district need. Uh, it's restricted to either CTE endorsements or non-core educational related endorsements such as foreign languages and the arts. So uh, we only have one teacher this year who's teaching art that requested an expert citizen endorsement, um, but it's uh, another avenue that we can explore if we have um, community members who have extensive background either in technology or working in the arts that uh, would like to come in and join our staff then this is a pathway that they can take to help us fill those positions. So as far as our teachers, uh, based on letter of intent, uh, 34 indicated that they were resigning from the district and we had 15 teachers to indicate that they were re retiring. We collected those letters back in January in preparation uh, for issuing of contracts. Um, the benefit of this process is to help us um, identify vacancies as early as possible. And that gives us more time to fill positions with highly qualified candidates. So when we go back and we look at the projections based on the work that we're doing, if we believe that we can completely uh, reduce that number of veteran teachers with, with expiring licenses down from at this point 153 to zero, uh, even if we only converted 75% of our provisionally certified teachers, um, and I have a, the updated slide shows that we will fill those positions or staff those positions for those teachers that are resigning. We believe that at least by August 1, we can have our projected positions not filled down to about 98 positions. And so we started this school year, August 2019, with 199 positions not filled and of course throughout the year reduced it down to where we currently sit, which is about 40. So it's not included in this version, but I did want to stress that the, the goal, the staffing goal of uh, my, my role, our staffing goal in the Office of Recruitment is to always start at 100%. So even though the numbers reflect that converting 75% is a, a reachable goal in my mind, we work as if we're trying to get it at 100% because the goal is for us to be able to start our school with a teacher, certified teacher in every classroom ready to start from day one so that our students can have the strong start that we, that we need in order to be successful. So as a part of uh, accomplishing that goal, one of the things that we'll be working toward in the Office of Recruitment is to establish a district-wide recruitment team. And as you can see from the diagram, we plan to pool members from every aspect of our district. District leadership, HR, public engagement, principals, teacher leaders, 
and uh, specifically developing school onboarding teams so that um, once teachers actually join the staff and are hired with the district and we get ready to push them out to their individual buildings, we need individuals that are in those buildings that are still essentially recruiting them, getting them acclimated to the school culture, the school community, uh, whether they're Mississippi born and raised or whether they're transplants to our great state, we want to be able to provide the needs that, uh, uh, or meet the needs that they have so they can become long lasting members of our school district. So what is the latest on staffing in our optimized schools? Our certified team members desiring to remain employed with JPS have been offered alternative placements at various schools. And our classified staff has been already placed by our HR team in comparable roles at new schools. So even though this information or the numbers were not reflected in the data, we do expect that as we enact the optimizing plan for equity within our schools, that that will also help us out as it relates to our staffing. So quickly, we'll move through the, the, the plan that we have for our hard to fill positions. Our major areas of need are always, uh, based on the numbers, have been elementary education, mathematics, and special education. Some of the incentives that we're using and st uh, strategies that we're using to address those areas will be the recruitment incentive, which is $5,000, and we've implemented various Grow Your Own initiatives and practice preparation to help our teachers meet the goals for certification for retention purposes. So just a little bit about the signing bonus. It's a $5,000 disbursement that's divided over three years. Uh, any new hire who commits and receives the, hire, uh, the signing bonus makes a three-year commitment to the district. And we're also looking for ways to expand its use uh, in order to attract certified teachers to our areas of highest need. These are the areas and the endorsements that are qualified. As you can see in the uh, qualifying grade levels and subject areas piece, that they're focused around pre-K, kindergarten, elementary education, mathematics, and science, as well as English, and English as a second language. We also have uh, a couple of pilot programs that we're working alongside the Mississippi Department of Education to pilot within our district. Uh, the first one is the Mississippi Teacher Residency, which is a three-year program where qualified teacher assistants are actually being mentored by veteran teachers while simultaneously earning, uh, doing completing coursework to earn a degree in elementary education. When they graduate from the program, they will have dual certifications in elementary ed and special education. Uh, the candidates as a part of the program make a three-year commitment beyond initial certification. Uh, currently, we have six residents that are going through the cohort one. We're looking to onboard 18 new residents for cohort two. Um, and we're in the middle of that process of selection. Uh, we're actually completing our interview and selection day at Blackburn Middle School on March 21st uh, here in the district. Uh, the second pilot that we're also participating in is the performance-based licensure pilot, which is an alternative pathway for teachers that struggle passing their practice exams. Participants are issued a JPS performance-based license to participate in the study for three years. A standard license is issued if students can meet growth goals for student learning by the end of the third year. In cohort one, we have 14 teachers in the district that possess the PBL license, and we're uh, in the process of preparing for cohort two. The application was uh, actually launched on today for various uh, teachers. And the focus for this upcoming cohort will be on elementary education and special education. Two new uh, partnerships that we're entering into to focus on mathematics and special education. The first one is a partnership for mathematics with the University of Mississippi. The teachers will receive a Master's of Education and Teaching Arts degree from Ole Miss with an emphasis in mathematics instruction. The tuition will be free to the participants except for the cost of books and fees, and we're opening up 10 slots for this summer. Um, Candidates are currently meeting the requirements. In other words, they are taking their practice exams and applying for the program to make sure that they can gain entry. The next partnership for special education is with William Carey University. Uh, teachers will receive a Master's of Arts in Teaching Alternate Route Certification for SPED from William Carey University. 
Pre-teaching coursework offerings and the internship will be completed right here in the district so our candidates will not have to travel and we have 15 slots available for this summer. Lastly, we are, um, we just finished up another cohort of practice prep with Schoolhouse 21, where we had 38 participants that received preparation in reading, writing, and mathematics. All of the, the, the uh, excuse me, participants received testing vouchers for their area of need and uh, will register and take the test within two weeks of the time that they received their vouchers. So uh, when we partnered with Schoolhouse 21, they reported an 89% pass rate with their participants, so we're expecting great results, and we're actually meeting with them tomorrow to, uh, to evaluate to see how they like the program and give them next steps as far as reporting their scores. Are there any questions? I, for one, this report is very thorough, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I feel like I have a better understanding of um, what our process is for you know, dealing with the difficult employment situation. Thank you. I have a question. Um, with the praxis, these are individuals who are interested in becoming certified. Are they already working in the district? Right. Good question. So these are individuals who are actually already employed within mm -hmm. the district, um, more than likely on a provisional certification. Okay. So part of them re, re, uh, completing the requirements to become certified involve them passing the Praxis Core mm -hmm. and their subject area assessment. So the Praxis Prep School, we focus specifically on the Praxis Core because that seems to be where most of our teachers are having the most trouble meeting the requirement uh, to become certified. Thank you. Dr. Knowles, um, <clears throat> this has been very helpful information. Regarding our signing bonuses, um, do you have a sense of how our bonus compares to other school districts' signing bonuses? Uh, or do they offer them and where we fall? Are we highly competitive? And I'm curious as to after the three years, the teacher's salary reverts back to where it initially was? Those good questions. Um, in, in my experience in the field as far as comparing our school district to other districts and signing bonuses, not too many other school districts offer a, si a signing bonus mm -hmm. as large as ours. I think the difference may be is the, the three-year commitment that is attached to the bonus and the way that the funds are dispersed. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing as far as what happens when they finish the three years, uh, the teachers get a step increase as they go through each year. So hopefully, by the time they reach the third year, their salary will be comparable to the money that they are making with the bonus by the end of that third good, year. Thank you, that's a good point, thank you. <laughs> and, and it's kind of a technical uh, thing, but just wanna, uh, we, we often use the word bonus, but, but um, by law, by Mississippi Constitution, it's actually a, um, an incentive. incentive. Yeah. Um, and so we'll, we'll be more um, consistent with that language just in case anyone's watching or listening. Great. This is very, uh, very helpful. Thank you. I can Thank see you. you and your team have been doing a lot of work. Yes, Thank ma'am. I, uh, I have a couple of questions, um, specifically around uh, the work with the provisionally certified teachers. So last year, there was, uh, I know there was um, some initial, um, initially there was an announcement by the Department of Education that um, there were going to be additional steps needed to certify teachers, and we had a large number of teachers who did not meet the requirements. Um, which many, I don't, anyways, it sounds like our strategy for this year is also contingent on MDE intervention. How confident are we that it's going to result in the scenario that's outlined in this presentation? So. We, we learned a lot uh, from last year and the experience we had uh, with the number of teachers uh, we were not able to convert from mm -hmm. year one to year two. <clears throat> and my experience personally, because I'm on the ground talking to and helping uh, these teachers reach their certification, was a lot of them did not understand the requirements for certification. So when this school year started, even really back this summer, 
uh, we started having conversations early with our teachers who were on the special non-renewable license, even at the time of application, that they understood from day one what they were signing up for. So we held general meetings to educate them on their requirements. Um, even now, we're doing the one-on-one -on -one meetings. We're doing follow-ups to make sure that these teachers are not only working on the work in their classrooms, but also making sure they're dedicating time to meeting those guidelines. So as I advise and I counsel teachers, I counsel them based on what the guidelines are now, not based on what the expectations are for the changes that are coming. However, because of the, the relationship that we've developed with the Mississippi Department of Education and um, their understanding that you know, the, the requirements have been difficult, um, that just knowing what those changes are and what we expect them to be coming down, they will assist with us being able to turn it over, but we're not necessarily planning or depending on the changes to make sure that our teachers are reaching the goal. So I expect a high, very high number of our teachers. Uh, I can't give you numbers today, mm -hmm. but as I meet and I go through, we have quite a few teachers who have already passed their exams. They're already enrolled in alternate route teacher preparation programs. Many of them have either already applied and received their, their three-year or five-year alternate route license, or they're waiting on um, semester to end this, this spring to be able to apply and convert. So hopefully very, very soon we'll have that tracker complete we'll be able to look at those numbers and see exactly where we are. But we, we, I think last year we were only able to convert nine. We're going to probably, uh, we're going to do better than that, probably about three or four hundred percent. So maybe even more than that. So is the, um, so that's, and that's specifically in reference to this three, 323 number, is that correct? Yes. And there's the 308 in year one. And then I saw there were 38 in the Praxis Prep. Are there 38 in the Praxis Prep these year one? Right. So they are part of the, the year one or the, the year two cohort that are still trying to pass those Praxis exams in order to meet the requirements for certification. And were there other? Is, is that the total for the whole year that, yes. that we enrolled in Schoolhouse 21? Yes. So we, we worked with Heinz this past summer. Uh, we had about 40 participants that went through a practice prep boot camp at Murrah High School over the summer. Mm -hmm. And then um, we continued with Schoolhouse this year, starting in about December, early January, to work through helping those teachers who needed uh, intensive mm -hmm. help as it relates to passing the test to get through. And we're also utilizing other resources as well. So um, Khan Academy partnered with ETS and practice to develop a free online test prep which, is very, which has been very helpful to our teachers. And uh, any news that we get from external sources that hold Praxis Prep from MDE or any educator associations, we try to share that information with our teachers to make sure that they have as many opportunities as they can to be exposed to the materials to help them with the Praxis exams. But once they get past that threshold, many of them, that's 90 to 95% of the issue. Once they pass the test, everything else is downhill. So MDE does provide some sessions to assist in the effort? They do. They outsource them through different companies, uh, maybe consulting groups or um, grassroots nonprofit organizations that hold mm -hmm. practice preps all over the state. And as we get that information, we just simply funnel it out to our provision licensed teachers to make sure that they know and have access to them um, in a timely, timely manner. Do we have any requirements for them to take advantage of those for those provisionally licensed teachers uh, requirements to for them to take advantage of those practice prep they just simply have to be able to show that they've attempted to take and pass the practice at least once uh, and we look at their scores and based on the ones who have the greatest deficit we try to get them in those intensive uh, intensive planning sessions of the, so and this is back of the envelope mass this this may not, these numbers may not <laughs> totally jive up so it looks like right now there's there's 323 non-renewable roughly this is under provisionally certified teachers again roughly 38 folks in praxis prep so you know around 280 or so left who aren't in praxis prep right and we're projecting an 80 85 slots that we won't be able to um, you know that we'll start the year with so of those 200 or so that aren't included in this number on august 1st 
How many of those are we counting as being able to be hired as a result of an MDE policy change versus they've met all the, the right. requirements to be right. certified? Right now, none. And we're still compiling the tracker. So as I meet and I counsel with them to see exactly where they are in the process, then I'll be able to better identify once the tracker is complete what our specific numbers are as it relates to how many of them are already in position to receive licenses, how many of them are not. And then once we know who is not ready, then we can circle back and start providing interventions. Uh, the reason why the number for the Praxis Prep School was so low because it was based on essentially funding. Mm -hmm. And we had to be able to limit it based on the amount of, of funds that we had available to provide that resource to candidates. So we look for the ones who had the greatest need and put them in so we can try to get them as much support as, as possible. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a relatively, um, I think, benign question. Um, it, if my memory serves me, we also agreed to a program that would potentially recruit international teachers to come fill some spots. I'm wondering if we've had any success in that program. We, we were working. We worked tirelessly, uh, I think, all the way up through December, but be, uh, because of, I'm going to call them hiccups, that we had with agreements between um, the, the international organization and the, uh, the State Department, we weren't able to get everything settled. Yeah, there, there are still some um, policies, state law, uh, that, that make it uh, challenging or, or, yeah, challenging to hire um, uh, international teachers. And so until some of that moves, um, the, that resource that we were engaging with, um, that we were kind of at an impasse. Thanks. Yeah. But that's, there's continued conversation around that. Um, and it's not just a Jackson thing. Um, you know, there are opportunities to, for staffing across the board in our state, so. I, I just didn't see it in the strategies of what we were addressing, just wondering if right. it was still ongoing. Right. We, we never actually if effectuated the, the, the um, contract with them. Uh, it was something that we brought to you to, to, because we were moving forward with that, but there was the issue with the um, policies. policies. Got it. Thank you. Do we do any analysis of the folks who are resigning? Are that, are that, in turn, what I mean by that is, um, are they in hard to serve? Uh, are, they, are the bulk of the folks running? Are they in the hard to serve categories? Um, do we know why they're they're resigning? Why? I, I haven't because I don't work specifically with that area. But that's definitely something we can go back and look into to see what the cause may be. And I can work with uh, Mrs. Lyons to to get that information, and we can start doing making plans around. How we'll address those issues. Want to, anybody want to talk to what what we're currently doing? I know we've got we've absolutely got plans to bolster that effort. Um, but if anyone wants to speak to what's currently happening, mm -hmm. so we do currently um, engage in exit surveys for each of the candidates. Um, and so, as uh, a person identifies that they would like to resign from the district, we ask them to complete an exit interview, which we have information that we look at. Um, Mr. Jimmy Coleman can compile that data, and we have uh, and analyze that for trends. Um, and often there are things that would not be at all surprising. There are issues of leadership and a misfit in terms of leadership and, and relations, um, additional needs for support and mentorship in, in the job and in the, in the challenge. We obviously know that teaching uh, is a, a challenging profession, and so uh, providing those supports to match and to pair with individuals who, um, you know, have that struggle. And so there's some things that we've done even in the Office of Teaching and Learning to shore up those beginning teacher supports because about 40% of our teacher workforce in the district is novice in the beginning uh, phases of their career, first through third year. So we want to provide a lot of supports. Um, and our Office of Teaching and Learning has um, tried to make that much more robust this year with teacher socials, um, and obviously the things that we've lifted in our strategic plan will give us more occasion to address the need for teacher mentorship and support so that we have fewer uh, teachers who are choosing to leave the district. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Knowles, for that, that uh, report and that information. I appreciate you. Um, as we do each month, uh, we'll now provide an update regarding the bond program. Uh, we'll use this time to provide um, updates regarding our progress as well as some of the challenges related to um, that work. Executive Director of Facilities and Operations, Mr. Don McCracken, is joining us now to provide those updates. Mr. McCracken. All right. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, board members, Dr. Green, thank you for uh, the um, introduction, uh, Dr. Green. Um, I would like to share with you where we are with the bond program. And this is um, starting with the professionals. We're in the process of bringing on new professionals uh, for phase two and phase three. As you may recall, we've already uh, have, uh, brought on uh, various architectural firms, eight architectural firms for phase one. And as we move into phase two and three, uh, we are in the process of bringing uh, at least uh, five to up to um, eight architectural firms. As of now, we've received um, proposals. We've issued a RFQ, and we've received proposals from 11 firms. Uh, two of those firms happen to be engineering firms, and the uh, balance uh, were, are, are architectural firms. So the dates have been established that we have proposed. Uh, to bring those to you uh, next month uh, for approval. As a part of the bond program, and you are aware that we did bring on uh, some additional support uh, with IMS Engineering, which is a local firm here in Jackson, and they have been quite instrumental in helping us to put some things that we have been um, vying to do for quite some time. And that is, um, in particular, is to work with architectural firms to make sure that schedules are established uh, and also that we can stay on, stay on schedule. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they have created a dashboard that will allow us to go to the uh, website to determine exactly where uh, each project phase is, the timeline for completion, all information that you need to know about a particular project. It is not open to the public at this juncture, uh, but we certainly are using it as a tool uh, to elevate uh, the progression of the uh, bond program. We have experienced a significant amount of rain uh, last month, and that is no surprise to anyone. Uh, that has delayed and deterred uh, some of uh, the, ex the exterior activities, primarily light uh, improvements as well as uh, walkways and um, asphalt improvements at different schools. Uh, however, as soon as the weather um, grounds are deemed solid, we will uh, proceed in getting that work completed. Before you, uh, you have a listing of projects that are under construction. Uh, this list uh, you've seen uh, in the previous document, but we wanted to add something to that and those are projects that were, that had started in February. Keep going. Those are highlighted in the yellow, and uh, some of these projects, again, deal with exterior activities, and they have been, uh, some have been delayed, but uh, the dates have been extended on some of the projects so that we can certainly complete those uh, by the end of uh, this year. Next group. Next group. Uh, here. Uh, we are in the final design phase for the, uh, athletic fields. Uh, we are uh, poised and ready to receive uh, the uh, construction documents for Hughes Field and uh, South Jackson Field or uh, Forest Hill. And we believe, uh, based upon the schedule that has been established and the timeline that we believe that is um, acceptable with the contractors, 120 days uh, it's a doable time to complete that work. So we're working with the architectural firm to make sure that we can get these bid dates uh, set and meet these timelines so that we can have construction uh, starting in May and completed by August 21st uh, of this year for the first games. Uh, this is just a disclaimer that we will uh, make some adjustments as the bond program progresses. 
And that, of course, includes uh, some timelines, uh, cost adjustments, and et cetera. And lastly, this is information regarding the project schedule, uh, projects that are scheduled to bid. Uh, the area that is highlighted, uh, those areas uh, indicate uh, bids that open actually today. And we did get some very good bids on that work, and we hope to make some um, uh, negotiations with the contractors so that we can begin to present it uh, to you for award. Today, we also have four projects that are to be awarded uh, for Jim Hill, Lanier, Provine, and Murrah. And this is an example of some of the work that we would like to do across um, the entire district, especially those that have exterior lighting. Uh, Forest Hill was suffering uh, for quite some time for lighting that reached right at 30% uh, throughout the uh, evening. And we have intensed that. We have increased that to 100%. Uh, these are new light fixtures that have been added. Uh, we had the old um, high-pressure sodium fixtures, and now we replace them with the LED fixtures, which brings a brighter surface and also a safer um, uh, environment for participants as, as well as students. And the takeaway today, we're moving forward with interior renovations at four high schools and design plans for uh, football fields. Uh, also, since the rain has delayed some things, uh, as soon as it improves, we will get back on track and uh, move the projects forward. Okay. Information can be found online, as uh, Dr. Sivak has apparently observed. Uh, and we would like to share that with the entire uh, Jackson community. Uh, any information that you would like to know about Jackson Public Schools bond program, uh, we have it uh, for your perusal, and we're transparent. And if you have any questions, please uh, contact uh, my office or uh, staff members. And with that, I welcome any questions. I have a quick question. Yes. Regarding our science lab renovations in our high schools, do we have any uh, teachers, science teachers, participating in the process? We have uh, communicated with science labs, science labs teacher or science teachers uh, to get a program in terms of what is needed, uh, what they anticipate uh, the future should, the space should look like. So yes, we did um, get advice from them, from them as well. And some of that advice will be <coughs> incorporated and come oh, yes. to fruition. By all means. By all means. <coughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. McCracken, for that um, information, for that update. Um, we're excited to, to see this work continuing, um, and we know that uh, members of the community are also really excited. I want to take, um, before I conclude my, um, my report and my remarks, just take a moment to thank, um, personally thank uh, Barr Elementary School and the folks at uh, North Jackson Elementary School. Those are the schools that I visited yesterday and today and read with the, uh, the scholars, um, and I read Green Eggs and Ham, which is one of my favorite Seuss, uh, Dr. Seuss books. Um, as you know, we're celebrating our Read Across America this week. Yesterday was uh, Dr. Seuss's birthday. So many of our team members um, who are here uh, have already gone out to uh, read and, and continuing to read this week uh, in our schools. And as well, I've gotten some messages and, and notices from members of our community who are also uh, out in schools reading to young folks and just engaging with them around books, which is just so, so amazing, and we, we greatly appreciate it. If there's anyone here in the um, boardroom who has already or has uh, scheduled time to go out and read to young folks, if you would, please stand and be recognized. Don't be shy. Thank you again. Um, our folks are just constantly going above and beyond the call of duty, and we appreciate it. I have to brag a little bit because the folks at uh, North Jackson really love me. Well, actually, <laughs> the, the folks at Bar really love me. They gave me a huge basket. 
Um, and then today I was at North Jackson and those um, uh, pre-K teachers gave me this wonderful card, um, which is wonderful. It has a wonderful uh, poem inside that I won't read it, but um, just about reading and reading to young folks. But it also has all of the really cool signatures <laughs> from our pre-K students. <laughs> which just lit me up today just to see their <laughs> signatures, which you gotta actually see it up front. It's uh, close. <laughs> It'll give you a chuckle. So uh, thank you to all the lovely um, scholars and the I educators at Bar. Pardon me? You gotta have it laminated. Have it laminated? Uh, I'm gonna wanna look at that uh, years from now. Just thank you again to everyone who's embraced this week uh, of, of reading and celebrating books. Uh, Madam President, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Green. So I did this last year. My favorite book is Are You My Mother? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And it's always, it's always so great to go in and see what astounding teachers we have yeah. and what wonderful kids we have and to spend some time with them. Um, also, in that same vein, thank you for your for reporting. Um, you, I find, and I don't know about the rest of the board, but I'm sure they probably agree, that we get so much information and it makes our job so much easier. And I really, really appreciate it. We have a good understanding of what's going on in the district and um, a good understanding of the district itself. It's huge. Um, and this reporting that you do during your presentation, um, I find extremely, extremely helpful. So thank you. Thank you, and I accept that on behalf of this incredible team that's uh, really helping us to do some pretty amazing things for our, our scholars. Thank you. All right, do we have any participants for public comment? No participants for public comment, okay. Next we have information um, only items. Dr. Jackson, no? Yes, we're kind of tied. Team. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson, uh, Dr. Green, members of the board. Um, we're bringing something to you um, that I, we wanted to make sure that I kind of gave an intro. This is something that may be relatively new, I think, to many of you board members. It's a single source request. Um, these um, requests are allowed by state statute. Um, 31713 um, does allow districts to make single source requests four items that we have done substantial research on to, to indicate that there are no other comparable items available for purchase so that we don't have to go through the bid process. So this is the process and I wanted to introduce, um, I think this is probably the first time you all have seen this, um, that um, Dr. Jackson has led an effort with um, two items at the CDC that we are presenting for you for information tonight and then for your approval at the next board meeting. So I'm now introducing Dr. Jackson, so she will introduce the two items for information. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, uh, President Johnson, and to the other members of the board, Dr. Green. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And I will start by saying we are uh, excited and looking forward to um, having our students experience these items. Uh, it's going to enhance these programs that these items will be used in and give a deeper level of learning for our students. The first item is the Festo uh, Mechatronics Lab for our engineering program. And um, this lab is used by all of the Mississippi secondary schools for the engineering programs that have engineering programs. And our students participate in the STEP program, the Student Technology Exchange Program at Nissan. And we are so happy to say that our students have won the, the STEP competition several years, and we're looking forward to winning again. And this will enhance what they do. So the Mechatronics Lab um, is a mixture, if you will, of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. And what it, in a nutshell, it's objects in motion. Um, students learn manufacturing, and they, it, what it comes down to is replacing humans 
with machines, machines replacing humans to do work. It cuts down the assembly line. So of course you all know at uh, Nissan manufacturing uh, automobiles, so our students have an opportunity to experience uh, the manufacturing process there. And they participate, and there's a manufacturing day. So this is an opportunity for them to enhance the skills that they use to participate in this STEP program. And that's for the mechatronics lab. The other item is a virtual reality lab for our, engine, for our agricultural environmental science and technology program. So agriculture in the inner city in Jackson Public Schools. So how many of our students have had the opportunity to experience real life animals, we teach animals in, in the program, as well as plants. So with virtual reality, here's an opportunity for them to, when you put the seed in the ground, we can watch the seed grow. We can see the digestive processes in animals. Um, we can see from conception to birth of a cow or pig or whatever. Agriculture is a leading industry in the state of Mississippi. So we're building this program, and of course we want to provide every opportunity for our students to experience every career pathway that's available to them in this state and beyond. So we ask for your consideration uh, to consider these, these items because it's going to deepen their level of learning. Thank you. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Sounds very exciting. It is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, sole source being we have done our research and, and we cannot find another vendor for these items. We have uh, spoken with the schools that already have uh, these items in place who are using them and there are no other sources to purchase the equipment. So, uh, Dr. Jackson, on this uh, virtual reality, yes. about <clears throat> how many of our students, our scholars, will that impact? Uh, we have about uh, 45 students uh, enrolled in our agricultural program right now. Now, like I said, we're in the building uh, of that program. Uh, many students, of course, don't understand or know a lot about agriculture. So this will be a wonderful recruiting tool for us as well. Uh, we have had tours in the past month. We've had elementary students um, as well as middle school students. So we're starting our recruiting a little bit earlier to allow students have, to have an opportunity to see what programs we offer at the Career Development Center. So they are captivated, they will be captivated by the virtual reality. So I'm, I'm watch, I can see things happen immediately. You know, as I said, when we plant the seed, we can see the tree grow or the watermelon grow, whatever uh, plants there are or animals. Yes, we can, we can see it happen immediately. So, so when our scholars put on this thing, this yes. headset, uh, is it connected to something else or is it? We have computer. There will be a computer and this is the software that will be loaded for them to use. Yes. And since it's connected to agriculture, it will lead them to uh, I'm sorry. Since it's connected to agriculture, it has the potential of leading them to uh, entrepreneurship in agriculture. Oh, absolutely. And uh, we're hoping to get beyond uh, agriculture and do some um, cross-curricular type things. We can work with other programs. We do integrated activities. So this is an opportunity. Let's. Uh, 
say, uh, for our health and clinical sciences program, one of the components that they have there is veterinary medicine. So here's an opportunity for them to work with our agricultural program and uh, those two programs to work together to see uh, what can come out of those careers. Now, I, I have experienced this yes, sir. device, and it impacted me uh, greatly. Uh, but I also know that just like the single source, that you can't, that there's no place in Jackson even to buy the, this device. Well, fortunately, this company is in Jackson. Yeah, I know so, the company it, yes. is, but the devices, you know, that we're going to buy. Yes, sir. They, they're not even in Jackson. They may be in the surrounding areas, but not in Jackson. And I think this company may even buy from, you know, someplace distant from the state. Even. Yes, and uh, we hear so much about innovation now. Uh, so, and this also uh, lends itself to incorporating more technology uh, into that program. All technology drives all of our programs. So this is just an opportunity to expose students to some of the best that's, that's out here now. This is really a step above uh, what we've seen in the past in virtual reality and augmented reality. We had uh, a vendor to come several years ago and share some information with us, and this is far beyond uh, what they shared with us a few years ago. So this is, will be a wonderful opportunity for our students. Any other questions or comments, board members? Can we expect to see these back on our agenda as an action item in our next board meeting? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. I just, Noah? I have, uh, this is a, a, a budgeting question. I was, uh, uh, which fund, tw fund 2711, which source of funds is that? That's vocation, vocational mm -hmm. education, okay. so vocational education, soil vocation funds. And then I noticed the contract this is included in the materials ends on 6-30-2020. We're pro this is a piece of equipment we it, will own it's and actually use. It's actually purchased, right. It's a, correct. Okay, so right. So it'll be used the well. The and what's the lifespan on the purchase of this equipment? Well, um, pretty much like everything else, especially with technology, it's changing constantly. So I would say the state usually gives us about five, five to ten years uh, on equipment. So probably at least five years. But, you know, things are constantly changing, so we would probably, with the software anyway, now the hardware part, uh, it should be okay, but the software we would probably need to update uh, probably every few years. We'll go back and, and get some additional information on that and bring it when we come back for um, asking for action. That would be okay. great. Thank you. We'll do that. Is this particular program, and I know it's CDC and for the veterinary sciences and what you all are focused on there, but does this company have other areas, subject matter, or is this their specialty? The, the virtual reality is their uh, specialty, and I'm sure they can provide um, additional uh, areas mm -hmm. uh, with the software that would be required to use. Um, on the hardware, yes, ma'am. Just curious about how we might could grow this for more students to be able to participate. Yes, ma'am. And we're looking forward to uh, adding to it once we 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 get it upon your approval. Um, <laughs> we're looking forward to uh, expanding. And like I said, every opportunity we can provide for our programs to work together. Uh, we encourage that, so uh, we'll try to grow more from this. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And we, again, we thank you for your consideration, and we are very excited about uh, providing our students the opportunity to experience uh, this equipment. Thank you. Um, now we have information action items. Um, Dr. Chrysler? As Dr. Chrysler is, is coming um, up to the podium, uh, 
uh, board members, uh, you're about to hear about a, a contract, um, and you and you have this contract um, that we, um, unfortunately, we were um, we're just kind of getting to the point where we could um, uh, get it approved or or review well review the contract itself reviewed by legal. Um, and to get it to you, uh, but we are in a, uh, the reason why it's coming information action tonight is because this is a, a more urgent need and we want to make sure that we have all of the support that we can get in order to, um, to deal with and, and manage through the uh, cyber uh, crime that we, dis that we spoke of earlier. And so um, Dr. Chrysler will talk a bit about this specific uh, agreement and what we're asking you to approve and then, of course, we can ask and answer any other questions that you might have. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, board President, Attorney Johnson, and other board members, and Dr. Green. You have before you a re recommendation to approve Adams and Reese to serve as breach counsel for the district for cyber-related concerns. As Dr. Green stated earlier, we're considering hiring a breach counsel um, to understand better what happened and possibly who committed this um, cyber crime. Um, the use of a forensic team will also allow us to ensure that our network is clean of the infection, as well as possibly help us to sustain or improve our cybersecurity. At this time, we ask that you approve the um, letter of engagement from Adams and Reese. Board members, are there any questions or concerns? Um, this is a clarification on the funding source for this contract. It looks like insurance is covering the cost of the contract. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One other just follow up. I, I see it in the materials here. That, so, so it looks like there's a hundred thousand dollar deductible. So, does that mean we cover the first cost with our own funds up to a hundred thousand dollars? We have we currently have three policies that cover cyber. Uh, our property policy uh, does require a hundred thousand dollar deductible if it's deemed as the primary carrier. We have not. Uh, filed a claim with the carrier just yet to know for sure if they're going to act as the primary carrier or an excess carrier. Um, we have another policy, um, our Chubb policy. Um, there would be no deductible if they're the primary carrier, um, as well as uh, a limit of a million dollars for this type of service. Okay, and so it's possible that insurance will cover all the costs or Correct. we would cover up to a hundred thousand dollars, I assume, out of district maintenance. Okay. Okay. I wonder, with the limit at a million dollars, what our um, losses were for the most recent attack, and whether that I have no idea what these kinds of things actually cost us. Right. So we're still determining the actual. We actually had some discussion about this earlier today. Still determining the 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 losses. Um, you know, we'll likely look at the the cost of the of time to to um, uh, kind of uh, over time to to reconstruct, recreate some of the um, documents or data that was um, that was damaged. Um, we yeah, and we'll continue to to investigate from there. But the 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 actual machines and that sort of thing, um, those kinds of damages to our, you know, right now it seems like that's limited, but, but we're, we've got to get more information. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I may not have been as clear earlier when I stated it, but, but this could have been far, far worse. This, this crime could have been far, far worse and far more damaging. Um, uh, thankfully, it was not. Uh, but we're still kind of understanding the extent to which there are any damages that we might need to recoup through through our um, insurance. Is it, is it likely that we'll find the perpetrator of this crime? I, I don't know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We, we obviously, <laughs> we're, we're doing all we can in working with the um, 
FBI, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and, and all of the um, IT professionals, um, and of course our insurance companies to to, uh, to figure it out. And how long is this contract with Adams and Reese? Um, I did not. Um, There's no limitation. It's just however right. long you need the services. Right. If the board wanted to insert, but it would be hard, I think, for them to predict how long their services might be needed. That's what I thought, but I just didn't see it anywhere or state it that way. Yeah. Any other? Go ahead. Who will liaise with the firm? Will it be... Ms. Chrysler. It'll be yes. Dr. Chrysler. Yes. Dr. Chrysler. As our, as I apologize. No worries. Mm -hmm. as, a, as our uh, risk management uh, person, um, she, uh, along with um, our legal team and our IT team, but she will be the, the key contact. Okay. Board members, are there any other questions? If not, is there a motion on the information action item? I move that we approve the engagement letter with Adams and Reese. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays. There being none, the motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Next, we have the consent agenda items finance. Um, board members, we've had an opportunity to review these matters previously. Um, are there any additional questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item finance? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved and Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Now we have the consent agenda items personnel. All of the consent agenda items personnel have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there additional questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items personnel? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Is there consideration to hold an executive session? There is no consideration to hold an executive session. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Um, Dr. Harrison has moved and Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Are there any nays? There being none, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.